What if a neighbor said to you, hey, I hear Trissels is making a big deal over same-sex marriage. But I don't get why. Marriage is about companionship and intimacy, a way to channel romantic feelings. So what's wrong with two men or two women getting married? That nice gay couple down our street isn't hurting anybody. What's wrong with a commitment to love? How would you respond? I would suggest that you say, those are very good questions. But they are not the first questions that need to be asked. The first I want to ask is about your definition of marriage. Where does your definition that marriage is about companionship and romance come from? Is it the definition that Jesus and God use? And if they care about Jesus and God and they ask further, um, and you know they're, they're interested in what God's definition of marriage might be, well then I would encourage you to pull out our text, uh, the beginning of Matthew 19, and read some of it to them. So let's look at our text now Um, Jesus is answering a question on the topic of divorce but he answers it by talking about marriage and there's a blessedly redundant section in it that helps us in our conversation with a neighbor like this verse 3 Some Pharisees come up to Jesus. Um, Yeah, to talk with him, but not really to have a conversation. Rather, to test him, to try to trap him. They asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? What they're doing is they're asking Jesus to weigh in on a controversy. Rabbis in that day disagreed on the reasons that a man could divorce his wife. Deuteronomy 24, verse 1, starts out, When a man takes a wife and marries her, if then she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some indecency in her, and he writes her a bill of divorce, And it continues on. Those are like three different conditional phrases there. The the disagreement was over what constitutes some indecency. Rabbi Shammai said, you can only divorce for the grave reason of some kind of sexual immorality. Rabbi Hillel A man can divorce his wife for almost any reason, even, he actually mentioned this, for burning the food. While Jesus does weigh in, and he makes it very weighty, he doesn't just go back to what Moses said in Deuteronomy, he goes back to what God said and did as far as marriage way back in the very beginning. Verse 4, Jesus says, Haven't you read that at the beginning, the Creator made them male and female? That's a direct quote from Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. And here's something for us to notice about what is marriage. When Jesus thinks about marriage and he goes back to Genesis... He doesn't just think about companionship. Uh, Marriage clearly is that. In Genesis chapter 2, Adam was alone uh, in all the animal world. He couldn't find a companion. And God said, it's not good for man to be alone. And 
So I'm going to make him a help meet. So companionship is definitely part of marriage, according to Genesis. But notice when Jesus is thinking about marriage and goes back to Genesis, he also quotes a verse that has to do with male and female. And in the verse after that, verse 28, uh, these males and females go on to increase in number and fill the earth. So is that a needed element of marriage? Jesus continues in verse, verse 5, The Creator made them male and female and said... For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. And that's a quote from the end of Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. Note, uh, because this is what Jesus picks up on, the word be in be united. That verb is in the passive voice. Uh, The text doesn't say in the active voice, and a man will join with his wife, uh, will unite with her, but is joined, will be united. This points to someone outside the couple acting. Specifically, it points to God, the divine author and agent in marriage, according to Genesis, and as we're going to see in Jesus. He draws this out directly, explicitly in verse 6. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. So there's the answer that Jesus has for the rabbis about divorce. Go back to Genesis. Marriage is God joining two together into one. And what God has joined together Don't separate. Well, the Pharisees think, aha, I think we got one on Jesus here. Uh, We can show that Jesus is wrong, that God does want some marriages to end. So they counter, verse 7, but Moses commanded that a man give his wife a certificate of divorce. In verse 8, when he, Jesus responds, he changes that verb. He says, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard, but it was not this way from the beginning. Jesus is acknowledging that sometimes people, because their hearts are hard, smash their marriage. And Moses instructed them that when a man does that, you know, with a hard heart, leaves his wife, takes up with another, he's not to leave that first wife in limbo. Sort of wondering, am I still married or not? How is he viewing me? In compassion to her, he's to give her a certificate of divorce. So if he's not still committed to her, then she knows it, and she doesn't need to act like they're still married. But Jesus says, this is God's sad concession to human sin. It's not God's intention. It was not how it was in the beginning, not how God designed things to be. So... In this discussion on divorce, Jesus has defined marriage. And it's basically marriage is God joining two together into one. Two whole and independent individuals are now also one new interdependent community. Something new has been created. Two have become this one new thing. And to support his case, Jesus has quoted Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. A husband is united with his wife. The passive verb points to God doing the uniting, joining them as one. 
But here's the, the blessed redundance. Jesus also quotes, as we saw, Genesis 1.27. God made them male and female. I want to read an, uh, an extended quote from Andrew Bunt. Uh, he says, Jesus didn't need to include that quote, the Genesis 1, 27 one. His point about not separating what God has joined is rooted in Genesis 2, 24. And Genesis 1, 27 has nothing to add to that point. In former, formal terms, Jesus' use of Genesis 127 in this conversation is redundant. Continuing my quote of Andrew Bunt, uh, who is one of the directors of Living Out. Uh, it's a group in Britain, a group of celibate gay Christ followers. And yet, for us, the inclusion of this additional Genesis verse is vitally important. By quoting these words, Jesus gives us an insight into his perspective. When Jesus thinks of marriage, he thinks of God's creation of male and female. Jesus viewed the creation of two different types of human, men and women, as key as he thought of marriage. Still more from Bunt. The fact that Jesus retains the original for this reason at the beginning of his quote of Genesis 2.24, placed immediately after the quote of Genesis 1.27, further strengthens this point. When trying to help people understand what marriage really is, Jesus explicitly underlines that it's a union of a man and a woman. He could have made this point simply by quoting Genesis 2.24, after all, the union in that verse is clearly a man and a woman, and yet he decided for some blessed reason to put it beyond doubt by also quoting Genesis 1, 27. So that's what we can say if our neighbor has a conversation with us. Jesus clearly understood marriage to be between a man and a woman. He went out of his way to explicitly draw attention to the man-woman aspect. Tell your neighbor, yes, on the definition of marriage that you used, marriage is just companionship, channeling our romantic feelings. Well, then opposing same-sex marriage really does seem pretty weak. But we at Trissels are wanting to use God's definition, Jesus' definition of marriage, and thus the relationship of that genuinely very nice gay couple down our street may not be the marriage that Jesus had in mind. Now, of course, the conversation probably won't stop there because there are follow-up uh, points that our neighbor can raise. For instance, they might say, sure, in Genesis, we see, we see the pattern, uh, the general pattern. Clearly, the pattern is for males and females. Uh, Jesus and Genesis clearly talk about that. But maybe that is only the general pattern for which there are exceptions. If your neighbor values, our neighbor values the Bible, they will want to know that Moses in the Pentateuch clearly ruled out same-sex exceptions. Uh, Leviticus chapter 18 through 20 is a passage often quoted in the New Testament. It's, it was seen by the Jews as sort of a summary of the law. Um, it has some verses about ritual purity, you know, which we, which 
ceremonial laws, unclean, uh, kosher, you know, the church does not follow them anymore. But it not only has things about ritual impurity, also has a lot to do with the moral law, contains prohibitions of vengeance, theft, injustice to the poor. It's the first place where we, where we read in the Bible, love your neighbor as you love yourself. And it also two times prohibits same-sex intimacy. 1822 and chapter 20, verse 13. And because of that, all Jews, including Jesus, including the Apostle Paul, understood God as prohibiting all same-sex sexual intimacy. And Paul actually, in one of his lists of sins, um, in 1 Corinthians 6, sort of quotes those passages from Leviticus. Uh, he coins a word formed from two words in the Greek version of those Leviticus passages. And definitely Jesus, as a Jew, uh, all Jews feeling this way, uh, he would have thought of, as he thought of marriage, he would not have had in mind male-male or female-female. Let me just uh, say, give one more instance uh, from the Apostle Paul. In Romans chapter 1, uh, Romans was like Paul's, um, it was a letter that he was writing to this church that he hadn't been to, he hadn't visited them before. So rather than dealing with specific things, he sort of lays out his general understanding of, of God, salvation, you know. Uh, so Genesis chapter 1, uh, as he begins painting this, description of his theology for this church that he was hoping to visit, uh, he again and again refers back to creation. Uh, there are many allusions to creation in, uh, Genesis, in, in Romans chapter 1. And then he ends the chapter with a long list of sins, and on that list is same-sex intimacy. And I want to point out that he... He describes mutual consensual forms like we see today. Uh, many times the argument is, well, the Roman world had pederasty and you know, oppressive uh, people in power were dominating others uh, in, that, in that kind of sexual relationship. But... They also knew, they clearly knew, mutual consensual forms like we see today. The particular verses, Romans 1, verses 26 and 27, he gives examples of female-female relationships which, which were known for their mutuality, not for oppression. And in verse 27, he gives examples of males with desires for one another for one another. This is not a one-sided thing. This is a mutual. And those mutual same-sex relations are, are on that sin list, and they are described as contrary to nature. They're not the way that God, God designed. So Paul clearly didn't see Genesis' pattern of male-female unions as only a general pattern for which there may be some same-sex exceptions. Now, I pray that you are not um, sort of cheering this sermon because you're basically like squeamish about who gays are and what they do. Because if that's why you're cheering this sermon, then 
when you finally get to know a gay or lesbian couple uh, down the street who turn out to be good and decent, then you're going to stop cheering sermons like this. I pray that you are cheering this because you genuinely love them, you genuinely want what is best for them because you know that Christ loves them, Christ died for them, and that you want them to flourish as human beings. And so therefore you care about what what God's design is, what God's plan is for their life. And so that's why that's why you are cheering cheering a sermon that says that that calls into question same-sex marriage. Because of your love for them and your love for God and his word, you want them to walk in the wisdom of God seen in the Bible. You want them to enjoy God's good design, which includes, as we have seen, marriage as, as something that's between one man and one woman for life. Going with God's design and God's definition is always best. We may not see how it's best, particularly if, if all the message and information and, uh, that we're getting is from a culture around us who, who disagrees with, with the Bible on this account. We may wonder why God doesn't allow same-sex marriage but when in doubt, I plead with you to always go with God's assessment. Always go with God's recommendation over your own. And by the way, uh, Christian scholars um, who I, these are not people with animus against gay persons, these are, these are persons who look, who have love in their eyes as they interact with gay persons. Out of that love, they, they are seeing some glimmers as to why God discourages same-sex relations as they look at overall patterns that we see in same-sex relations. I am, now this is my opinion, this is my faith, but that down the road, I don't know how long it will take, but, but uh, research will clearly show that, that uh, same-sex marriage is a way that has many, many more pitfalls, many more uh, areas in which it can go wrong than what heterosexual marriage does. We see, we see all the many things that can go bad with a man and a woman being married, but the probability is so much higher when it's man, man, and woman, woman. And uh, I've, I've, because so many people have this question, I've been uh, collecting things that I've read and uh, if you want my short summary of it, uh, read the last section in, uh, in this article that uh, here's a short URL for it. Uh, in case you're wondering, the HMSSATB is Harold Meller, Same Sex and the Bible. When I look at it, I see His Majesty's ship soprano alto tenor bass as well but anyway <clears throat> i'm gonna i'm gonna close with one brief tilt at our culture's windmills at one of our culture's windmills um, your neighbor might believe that the only real moral moral error is someone being prevented from some life they imagine will make them happy uh, some, some outside force oppressing them in the sense of, of keeping them from acting according to their nature. 
whether that nature arises from genetics or environment or some trauma that they went through in their early childhood, they think that persons should be able to express or unfold whatever they feel is their unique core and that those around should always completely support them in expressing those feelings and that all of us should reject anything outside of us that asks us not to express our unique core. Uh, maybe it's a moral system, maybe it's a religion that would tell us not to, to express who we are, what we feel. Maybe it's some relationship that tries to stop you from that. Well, that, Anything that tries to hinder us from expressing who we are, we should reject it. That's, that's very prevalent. That's, that's, uh, that's sort of accepted. Virtually nobody questions that. But that's not what we get from Scripture. There are many parts of our nature that we are told to resist, that we are told to put to death. I'm going to just close with a, with a famous illustration that Tim Keller came up with um, that basically shows that, that that understanding of self is not true, um, <clears throat> that none of us simply choose to be ourselves. All of us allow things outside us to shape us and tell us which desires, which intuitions we restrain and subdue, and which we embrace and, and express. Here's uh, Tim Keller's example. Imagine an Anglo-Saxon warrior in Britain in AD 800. He has two very strong inner impulses and feelings. One is aggression. He loves to smash and kill people when they show him disrespect. Living in a shame and warrior, shame and honor culture with its warrior ethic, he will identify with that feeling. He will say to himself, that's me, that's who I am, I will express that. The other feeling he senses is a sexual attraction to his fellow warriors. To that he will say, that is not me, I will control and suppress that impulse. Now imagine a young man walking around Manhattan today. He has the same two inward impulses, a desire to smash things in people and same-sex attraction. Both equally strong, both difficult to control. What will he say? He will look at the aggression and think, this is not who I want to be. And he'll seek deliverance in therapy and anger management. And he will look at his sexual desire, however, and conclude, that is who I am. Keller shows that none of us simply choose to be ourselves in a vacuum. We constantly sift through our often contradictory feelings and evaluate them in the light of things outside us. We evaluate them by our values which are generally absorbed from our cultural setting. But we at Trissels want to decide who we are and what we should do by looking at Jesus, by looking at our, our Creator and our Creator's design. To truly understand ourself, we look upward not look inward. We trust God and God's assessment, God's direction, God's guidance more than we trust our impulses, our instincts. And I am glad that we can be part of a community trying to do that together.